we're going to be talking about, as I like to call, the campaign for you. Uh, finding your place in the nonprofit sector. And I call it the campaign for you because uh, even though we might not get into it quite so much uh, today, you'll find that uh, for those people who have been in fundraising in nonprofit, that uh, getting a job uh, is just running a campaign, is just the gift. The final uh, prize at the end isn't uh, uh, millions of dollars in charitable gifts, it's a job for yourself. So uh, let's get ourselves started. And one of the things I thought was really important to kick off with was a quick discussion about what nonprofits are. And, and I do this kind of to bring everybody on the same page and we're gonna go through a few slides like this, but they're mission-driven organizations. Now, really important part, this next part here, serving the public good or a group of people with a common interest. So what's that mean? What do these three mean here? Well, first of all, right, that not all nonprofits are charities. And what I mean by that is, is really just that, that 501c3s, the kind that you know, everybody thinks of as a nonprofit, those are traditional charities. It represents about, you know, like I say here, more than 70%. And largely, if you get a tax deduction, then that's that kind of nonprofit. It's a 501c3. What makes them unique in our world and the pantheon of nonprofit organizations is that they are largely open to everybody. And so, and they offer services to anybody. So a 501c3 has that special place uh, that if you, like I said, make a charitable donation, uh, then you get a tax deduction. And be surprised. That is actually a worldwide phenomenon, at least in the uh, Western developed world, uh, where uh, whatever their charity classification is, tends to come with a, some sort of tax benefit. Now, the other kind of nonprofits are very different in that you don't get tax yeah. benefits, but they focus on a circle of people. So think of chambers of commerce, right? you join a chamber of commerce and the people who get the benefits from a chamber of commerce are the ones who are members of that chamber. Uh, C4 advocacy organizations are that way. Uh, cemetery corporations, who says the IRS doesn't have a sense of humor, right? They're C13s. Uh, but uh, you also see uh, this with uh, mutual insurance companies, black lung trusts, um, uh, credit unions. Those are all organizations. They're among those 30 different kinds that, benefit a, a group of people around which you can draw some sort of circle. They're nonprofits, but not charities. Now, uh, and I'll give you a Wikipedia link here if you want to check into uh, more about what these uh, other ones are. But the reason I bring this up is that to kind of broaden your perspective, because we all talk about, you know, I want to work for a nonprofit. Well, you could work for a chamber of commerce. That's a nonprofit. It's a C6, but, and it has a mission. Remember, they're all mission-focused organizations, but it's not your traditional charity. Uh, there are any number of organizations like that. And, I, and like I said, I wanted to broaden your horizons to say, you know, maybe there's some other things here for me in the nonprofit field. So why do we call them nonprofits? Hint, not because they're supposed to lose money or can, uh, can't make a profit. In fact, that's one of these kind of misnomers out there. I, I was in a church board meeting years ago, and the pastor was was all about saying, "Well, we we can't make a profit. We can't we can't have any money left over." Wrong. You are allowed to make to have money left over at the end of the year. That's a healthy thing. You want to have uh, uh, an overage at the end of the year. They're just not profits. They're just not the um, uh, in a profit in an accounting business sense. So they are allowed to have extra money because the money's made over income get plowed back into the organization, right? There's no shareholders. And so profits really in nonprofit speak are called surpluses. And you can have plenty of surpluses and it's healthy and you wanna do that. Now, like I said, 
there's no shareholders, right? There's nobody owns a nonprofit. The board of directors is not a group who actually has a, a stake, a financial stake in the organization, except that they, they ought to be donors. But in terms of any ownership stake, not the case. Now, nonprofits can own for-profit businesses. And you see this all the time. A lot of universities and colleges will own housing around them, uh, market rate housing to stabilize neighborhoods. Uh, some, uh, I, when I worked for University of Cincinnati, we owned an auto, paint body, uh, auto body paint shop in Seattle. It came in a will. It was actually, be, it was relatively profitable. So they kept it in the portfolio, right? Uh, which was fine. So, you know, nonprofits can own for-profit businesses, but nonprofits may not be owned by other businesses. So Coca-Cola Foundation, which is a nonprofit, is not owned by the Coca-Cola company. However, the, the people who are on the board may also be employees of the Coca-Cola company or have some interest in Coca-Cola, and they might coordinate their marketing efforts so that one benefits the other, but they are not owned. And that's important to keep in mind. The boards are the stewards of the mission. And, and so if you think about this, the boards keep the mission on course. The staff are usually the ones who carry out the mission. So a board will, will set the direction, set the policy, the staff will carry that out. The board is the stewards of the money. They might work with investments. I mean, the, the staff should too, but, the, uh, but they do the, the 30,000 foot job uh, on the board and the day-to-day -day is done by the staff or volunteers. Nonprofits can also have volunteers. They can host volunteers. That's an important attribute. And uh, it's, you know, another way of giving, right? Time, treasure, talent, right? And so um, this is the uh, time and the talent part, which is working with volunteers. Let's see here. There we go. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, sometimes they're tax favored if there's a particular kind of nonprofit. Uh, the double bottom line, and this is, this is an important point too, that nonprofits, the mission is the primary bottom line. Are they carrying out that mission the way they should be? In fact, to a point where sometimes you say, well, that doesn't make financial sense. Yeah, that's right. It probably, whatever it is, might not make financial sense, but go back and look at the mission. Are they fulfilling their mission? And then that's where fundraising and other revenue generation comes in to help make up that money uh, that might be lost in carrying out missions so that they are financially solvent for that important dollar money bottom line. Uh, nonprofits relieve government of responsibilities. Uh, we have a very strong ethic in our culture that talks about uh, government not being as effective. We can debate that one way or another, but a lot of people would prefer to see a nonprofit carry out responsibilities that are government-esque uh, as opposed to governments themselves. Uh, they fill in the gap between government and business. And interesting, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but nonprofits start and rescue parts of our economy. You're starting to see a trend these days in newspapers moving into nonprofit realm. Philip Inquirer is, is owned by a nonprofit. Uh, there are newspapers in the West that are owned by nonprofits. Uh, I think NPR, well, I know NPR is a nonprofit, right? So where journalism is becoming less profitable uh, as a business model, it rests very nicely in the nonprofit world. It also, nonprofits start parts of our economy. You look at higher education from way back in the beginning, of, you know, with Harvard being the first uh, in the new world or fire departments here in Philadelphia being the first, they start as nonprofits. Eventually they might move into government entities, higher education had state universities, and then they move into for-profit entities like the for-profit uh, you know, Phoenixes and Strayers of the world. So, and something even as much as rocketry, uh, you know, the going to the moon kind of rocket started at a nonprofit at a university, uh, became government entities, you know, the government got into the rocket game, and now you see private business carrying that over. So nonprofits start and rescue parts of our economy 
Uh, and so, and it's kind of cool to see, you know, getting in on any of those areas uh, to see where you can serve as a nonprofit. So where do you fit? As somebody who is looking for a career, right? Now that you know a lot of the above we just talked about, right? Where do you fit? Well, are you, and by the way, this, this slide here is in a specific order for a reason, because money comes into an organization, the mission spends the money on whatever the mission is, and then there are people who account for that spending, and then infrastructure covers all things across both or all three of those other areas. So are you involved in revenue generation for a nonprofit? Now, that's not just fundraising. In fact, one of the nonprofit's secrets, I don't know, dirty secrets, but secrets, is that uh, more revenue comes in for fee for services than any other way. They think of higher education, right? Tuition is a fee for service. Uh, your hospital bill is a fee for service. Now, they, these nonprofit hospitals, nonprofit higher ed, certainly have fundraising and they have other things that, to pay for, uh, for what they do. But even in small nonprofits like uh, youth sports leagues, people pay to register, right? They pay, that's a fee for service. Which by the way, fees for service are not tax deductible because you're getting something back. It's only charitable gifts that are tax deductible. So do you fit in the revenue generation area of that nonprofit, whatever it is, whatever they do? Do you fit in the mission purpose of the nonprofit? Are you a healthcare worker? Are you a social worker? Do you work in the environmental field somehow that you plug into whatever it is that they do for their mission? Are you a stewardship person, right? So do you work with accounting? That, now, you might think accounting might be the only thing. It's a big part of stewardship, but there's also people in nonprofits who, who report on the results of what the mission people have done. Uh, especially in bigger nonprofits. Uh, they might evaluate what the, how the mission is effective or not. Uh, they might have public policy uh, responsibilities. Uh, I, I know People's Emergency Center in Philadelphia has a vice president for public policy, which really is the person who takes what's going on with the mission and sees how their mission has been effective against the public policy goals of uh, whatever that mission is. In their case, um, homelessness. Uh, now, then there's also infrastructure, could be human resources, it could be facility maintenance, but these are the things that cover the other parts, you know, that kind of touch all the other bases there. So ask yourself, how do you fit into this continuum of, you know, really following the money through a nonprofit? And your skills might lend themselves to one part of this or another. Now, it's important to know, we talked, I just mentioned about this, where does the money come from in a nonprofit? Well, we talked about fee for service, right? Uh, so if you're, uh, like I said, you know, college tuition, hospital bills, uh, people paying for, uh, you know, some meal programs have a, uh, like a, a small copay or something like that, whatever it is uh, that that's, you're paying for, even if it's not the total value of whatever you're paying for, believe it or not, college tuition is not the total value of, of whatever that service is, at least for uh, most uh, universities, um, then uh, that's a part of fee for service. Now, government sources. Interesting because government money sometimes really is fee for service. So if a nonprofit gets a grant to do a Head Start program, that's the government is actually contracting with that nonprofit to provide that daycare program, or if it's research money grant, it's the same thing. That's really fee for service. So other government sources might include uh, money that is uh, allocated by legislative uh, uh, means, or uh, what uh, we um, uh, nicely call walking around money that some government officials get to be able to apply to specific projects in their district. So. Monies can come from those sources and where you, you might fit into somehow working with the, that in a potential job. There are certainly people who are government relations officers in nonprofits. Giving and fundraising, uh, we certainly uh, talk about that and we won't get into the details of that except to tell you that there, I firmly believe there is a place for anybody in that realm uh, from uh, the person who will sit down all day and write letters and not 
want to touch a single donor to people who are great to getting out there and uh, shaking hands and meeting people and talking to you know, donors. There's a lot of opportunities in that area. And then outside businesses and investments. Like I said before, nonprofits can own businesses. They have investments in things called endowments, which are basically savings accounts for nonprofits. And so uh, that, that's another place that uh, you might fit in so far as the income stream of a nonprofit goes. So bottom line, are there opportunities in nonprofits? There sure are. If you're willing to work, if you're willing to learn, and this is huge, and if you're willing to cut your pay. And I say that not, and it says you're not for the reasons you think about the cutting the pay. Because it turns out that in some instances, pay is better at nonprofits for some things. However, the pay cut might be because you don't have the experience coming in that other people do in those specific areas because you had, you're, you're essentially changing careers and what you come with may not be with the same experience as people who have been doing that for a while. So it may not be that by the nature of the nonprofit, it pays less, sometimes nonprofits do, but it might be the level of experience you have. Now, of course, willing to learn, right? You're gonna have a big learning curve when it comes to nonprofits and willing to work because working for a nonprofit is not easy in terms of the length of hours, in terms of, of the, the physical, mental labor, uh, the emotional toll it takes on a lot of people. So, uh, but if you're willing to you know, meet some of these con conditions, yeah, you know, working for a nonprofit is a great thing to do. So, why? Well, you might have skills that are common in nonprofits. You know, if you're a social worker, chances are you're gonna work for a nonprofit. Maybe you'll work for a government, you're probably not gonna find many opportunities in the for-profit sector. And there are some skills like that, uh, some, some training that people have or whatever, that just are common in the nonprofit sector. And so those folks are gonna land there for whatever you know, reasons. Uh, nonprofit people are friendly. Yeah, you know, if you go in thinking that, you know, it, what people, uh, people who find people friendly are the folks who always find people friendly, right? If you found them friendly in a for-profit, you're going to find them friendly in non-profit. But uh, really, though, um, that's a bit of a mythology in that, uh, you know, I know grumpy people in business. I know grumpy people in non-profits, and I know nice people in both. So don't think that you're going in because people are friendly. People cooperate more? Maybe. Um, uh, I know a lot of folks who... Uh, who are, uh, you know, it's uh, what's mine is mine and what's yours is negotiable, who work for a nonprofit. Uh, and I know a lot of people in business who cooperate rather well. So it's, again, not don't go in thinking that people are going to be friendly and cooperate because, yes, I think you will find that, but you will also find that in businesses too. So it's, I, I just I put that out there. Um, a lot of people will go to nonprofits because they, they think or feel that it'll be emotionally fulfilling. I think that's a good reason to work for a nonprofit, but also realize it's going to be emotionally draining a lot of times. That, uh, that you know, you're working for a mission, for something that people are invested in, they put their whole selves into. And I will tell you, especially if you lose a job after you've invested so much of yourself into a nonprofit, that's really tough. And uh, so it's, um, uh, it can be fulfilling, but it also can be emotionally draining and you need to go in with your eyes open with that. Now I say nonprofits pay well. They have a reputation of not paying well, but it's fascinating that in certain industries, uh, in certain jobs, nonprofits actually pay rather well. Nurses, for example, uh, my, my sister, I will tell you from personal experience with her and I've seen surveys that bear this out, that uh, she's a nurse, she's an RN. Uh, she has worked in for-profit hospitals and nonprofit hospitals and find that the nonprofit hospitals pay better. Why? Because the profits in, an, in a for-profit hospital go to shareholders and the, the profits or the surpluses in nonprofit hospitals go back into the organization and they tend to pay a little better. And there are, like I said, numbers that show this. So uh, job depends, you know, here and there, 
uh, but a lot of times uh, nonprofits will actually pay better. A lot of times they won't. Um, and you don't always need to take a pay cut um, for working for a nonprofit. Uh, they're stable employers. Sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, it really depends on the economy. A lot of folks uh, gravitate to bigger nonprofits because they think they're stable. Not necessarily the case. I mean, look at higher education is really taking it tough on this round. Uh, and uh, a lot of other kinds of nonprofits are. So they are not necessarily uh, stable uh, employers, but in some economies they are. And it really, sometimes that depends on the mission. Uh, you know, in, um, in good times, uh, arts organizations do really well. In bad times, uh, people shift their money to things that are more touching folks personally uh, in terms of social services and healthcare. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. Is if you're looking for stable employment, you may or may not find it with nonprofits. Uh, a lot of folks say, "Well, the the work pace is uh, is better." You know, I can uh, essentially what they're saying is that they like I say a little down below a little differently here. Uh, they they can cruise or you know do a little less work. No, no. In fact, um, if there's any place that you're going to have more hats than anywhere else is going to be working for a nonprofit which really in a lot of respects makes nonprofits great for people who are early career workers because they're gonna get a broad variety of experience and be able to grab onto things that they would not necessarily have had the opportunity to work with in a business environment that's much more siloed and, and nuanced. Uh, but uh, yeah, don't go into a nonprofit expecting that in any way that you're going to have an even paced kind of work environment. Uh, nice facilities, maybe, but maybe not. Again, that wide range there of people who um, uh, work in what are effectively uh, war zone kind of uh, facilities. Uh, I know people who've come from military careers who uh, work in nonprofits and say these are right up there from what they've seen in the, some war zones uh, to the, uh, to very nice, well-outfitted nonprofits. So don't think that that's going to be a, a particular reason to do this. Um, you can just do your job and not worry about money. No, uh, not the case. Uh, nonprofit goals are not less demanding. Uh, this is not a place to cruise until retirement. Uh, but a lot of folks say, well, I can't do any better. And unfortunately, that's not a great reason to work for a nonprofit because uh, nonprofits deserve your best. And uh, I, unfortunately, I hear that sometimes uh, from folks. Uh, and it concerns me because they don't put nonprofits at the standard at which they really should be and the mission deserves. So how do you prepare? Well, you want to focus on yourself first, just like any other job, right? And ask yourself, what's motivating you to achieve? Why are you passionate about what this is? What missions do you love? And you know, are you a numbers person? Do you want to connect with people? Right? Whatever that is, you have to understand what your motivations are and what missions turn you on. It turns out that in nonprofits, more than anything, that that mission connection really counts. Uh, I know a nonprofit locally here who works with cancer uh, patients and people, families who deal with cancer issues, not just the patients themselves. And they won't hire anybody who does not come with an experience with cancer. Not personally, they don't need to have cancer themselves, but a family member or a close friend or something, they have to have a story that kind of motivates them that way. Now, you might say, um, you know, well, isn't that discrimination or isn't there something there? Well, no, actually, the law is on their side in a lot of these cases, especially when it comes down to things like faith, um, uh, where, uh, you know, they, they're, the rules don't force nonprofits to hire people who might be, uh, might not hold like their same faith statement or something. So, uh, but that's an important part. So it's not only the skill set you're bringing, as it says to the next point here, what a, what will you, you know, aid nonprofit, but what missions do you love? And of course, ask yourself, what don't you know about nonprofits? Of course, you can go to nonprofit.courses for that, right? Okay, educate yourself in the sector, All right? <laughs> nonprofit.courses. And I say that a little bit tongue in cheek here, but no, really, it's a, there's a lot there. And, you know, um, we talked about that. But 
how are nonprofits different and same from where you're coming from? You'd be surprised. A lot of businesses are um, uh, work very similarly to nonprofits. Folks will say, well, nonprofits are just another kind of business. Not quite. Uh, they, they have a lot of similar things, right? You're going to run uh, computers, you're going to have accounting, you're gonna, but the accounting actually has different standards. Uh, you have a lot of the, the stuff that looks like business, but is not business because of that mission focus. But you can find a lot of common things. It, for example, uh, a lot of people come from sales, will find a lot of similarities, although it's not the same as charitable gift fundraising. So, uh, you know, educate yourself on what's the same and what's the difference between what you want to do, what you have done in a for-profit business and where you're going in a nonprofit. And I think the most important thing is to meet people who are working for nonprofits, particularly people who have made that transition. Really important that those are the folks who can tell you firsthand what it is to make that leap if you're changing from one sector like government or business to nonprofits, but just meet the people who are working especially in the job that you cite that you want to have in a nonprofit. That will tell you a lot, educate you a lot, but also uh, give, start building your network so that they can recommend you to others. And I say here, educate yourself on the missions, right? Well-intended doesn't cut it. I'd say there's a lot in the grant proposal writing classes I, I teach, but also I think it's the same in getting a job that you want to learn as much as you can about the mission that you hope to serve. You know, you want to be, bring expertise to it, even if it's self-taught expertise, you know, as long as it's from good legitimate sources, right? But the idea though, is that you want to be able to talk about that mission um, as opposed to saying, well, you know, I always felt like people with cancer needed help. So I'm, I want to do cancer. No, no, no. Learn about cancer. That's huge, especially whatever variety of cancer it is that you are working with or that your uncle had and now you want to serve, whatever that is. And at, maybe even you can live it. Um, I had a student uh, who worked for a church in the D.C. area who took people to um, uh, be homeless for 24 hours in the streets of Washington, D.C., so that they could work with the homeless population and understand what it was like to live on the streets. Um, Inglis House, the, I mentioned uh, before we started all this, uh, their staff, uh, because a lot of their people are in wheelchairs, are either uh, people who have quadriplegic issues or paraplegic issues, um, they will say, uh, put a staff who is full and able-bodied in a wheelchair and say, do your job for a day. Now, can it replicate exactly what their experiences are in these cases? No, but it gets you into the head of the people you serve. And that's real huge when we're talking about working with nonprofits. So educate yourself on the skill you will offer, right? Like we said, fundraising versus sales, business and nonprofit accounting are different. There's different rules in HR between business and, and nonprofit and marketing, uh, different techniques that are, uh, palatable or not from one side to another or things you can bring across. So whatever it is you're going to do, know the differences so that you can kind of compare and contrast and build what you're offering to that nonprofit organization. Right. But working for nonprofit, like I say, isn't a charity. Don't expect them to say, ah, oh, we were waiting for people from the business sector to find us. No, they're not looking for you. Right, like we said, discrimination laws may not apply. Right now, this word and I, I've <laughs> barely. I, I uh, the giving back kind of uh, um, is a bit of a lightning rod for some people in the nonprofit sector. When they said, "Well, I want to give back now," yeah, well, you know, uh, these people have been doing this work for years. Right, they've they've given their lives, and now suddenly you're saying, "Well, I want to give back." Well, you know, where have you been before that? Um, they're, they're, they're just be careful sometimes uh, that things that, it's like any other circumstance we learn about in our lives, that you might say, well, that's just the way you put it. No, it might feel or seem condescending to the people you're talking to. And giving back is one of those areas that might be. Uh, and, and ask yourself, you know, what have you, 
they, they will legitimately ask, what have you done for us lately? Have you been a volunteer for a nonprofit? Even though you haven't worked for one, have you volunteered for nonprofits? Have you sat on a board? What your, they're not going to ask you, you know, to show your 1040 about the, the causes you give to, but you might talk about, well, I give to this cause because of this. Have a bit of a track record in charitable giving and be able to, to show that you have some interaction because it's interesting. Not everybody does. Uh, my uh, sister-in-law's family, uh, I think, never realized they have ever oh, uh, interacted with nonprofit. And what I mean by that is that they, they've been to the local hospital, Doylestown Hospital for them, which is a nonprofit, but it was very transactional. The kids were never in sports. Uh, they didn't, didn't go, they went to public universities. They had all these interactions with, with entities in their lives, but very little in nonprofit. They don't understand what that is. Your ability to talk about your interactions with the nonprofit sector is huge when working to get a job in the nonprofit sector. Passion only goes so far. If you have a passion for whatever cause it is you wanna work for, that's great. You need to start there. It might carry you a bit, but it's going to be hard. And you're going to ask yourself, really, I loved this when I was a volunteer, but boy, I'll tell you, now that I work, you know, it's like, you know, now that you see how the sausage is made, right? So just don't expect your passion to carry you through that experience, you know, your passion for that mission. Nonprofits need and deserve experience. So don't, think, you know, that you're going to change jobs and, uh, and that they're going to love you and welcome you because you just came from this other kind of job and it doesn't really match what they need. They need experience in what they do. And so the closer you can bring to that or translate what you did in the business sector into something that works for them for nonprofits, you're better off. That really makes a difference. And yeah, what, one of those other things besides giving back, right, is to say, oh, I can make more money in the business sector, but I decide to work for a nonprofit. No, that will, <laughs> unfortunately, then, then we'll say, simply say, great, go find a job in the business sector. That doesn't work. You want to accept that this is what it is. This is the job. And if that's what they're paying, that's fine. And if you want to make more money and they offer it in the business sector, go ahead and do that. But don't come in with that attitude. And I, I just, I know a handful full of people who have said that, that have really um, alienated folks in the nonprofit sector. And of course, realize that, I mean, being a volunteer, you want to be a volunteer coming in, you want to be able to talk about its experiences, but being a volunteer is not the same on being, being on staff. You know, volunteer, you can walk away and they treat you that way as though you can walk away. And so they give you perks to kind of incentivize your work and to help you stay with it and keep that passion going. But when you flip into being on staff, it's a different world and the motivations are different and the demands are different. So it's good. You want to have volunteer experience if you haven't coming into a nonprofit, but don't think it's the same as being on the staff. So what can make you attractive, right? Can you bring in money? Money is always a need in a nonprofit, hands down. So if you, if you can do whatever it is, and it's not necessarily fundraising, but other things that bring in money, you can be very valuable to the nonprofit. Are they in crisis? Do they need new perspectives? That will also make you more attractive to a nonprofit. In this environment, if you can bring a new perspective to whatever they do, um, that you could be valuable. We talked uh, about an organization that uh, gives experiences to children who might have terminal uh, illnesses uh, before the, the started, you know, before the uh, slideshow. Well, you know, I'm thinking, gee, maybe like virtual experiences, if you could bring something that way to them, uh, that to meet this crisis that not being able to ship kids to Disneyland or whatever, that could make it valuable. Are you being referred? That's really important for any job, but nonprofits especially because uh, they are depending on folks who already have experience with you to kind of give you, give you the stamp of approval before they look at you. So referrals, uh, great for any job, but nonprofits uh, will really help you out. Uh, do you have the skill, whatever that skill is, and we talked about that before, the personal background with their mission, you know, if you, if you somehow connect to whatever that mission is, 
uh, and then your track record as a board member or volunteer, that also helps just realizing that's not going to be the same as staff. So, you know, one of the opportunities you have coming into the nonprofit sector is that you, that, that they are more open than a lot of businesses are so far as getting information before you walk into the, um, into the interview. Of course, any organization, you want to go to their website, right? You want to see what that has to say. But then you can get a 990 tax form from GuideStar, otherwise known these days as, oh boy, I just, that just drained out of my head. Um, but guide, go to GuideStar.org, you'll find it. Um, and then the nonprofit watchdog sites like the Better Business Bureau, Give.org, uh, Charity, um, Charity Navigator, some others that way. Funders websites might list who their um, funders, uh, who they fund and might have little blurbs about uh, those organizations, and then ask in the community. Uh, that's really important to talk about, uh, to ask in the community about nonprofits, because that's where you're going to get some of the, the real dirt on what's going on there or not. Now, make connections. Uh, one of the last people I know who got a job in a nonprofit uh, was totally networking. And, you know, so you want to do the informational interviews, which you can do very easily, even in our current environment uh, through video calls or telephones. Um, networking events, when they become, you know, in-person events, again, that's good, but even not, you know, you'll find chambers of commerce and all that are running virtual events and you can plug into those. Professional associations are huge. Uh, and, you know, there are so many in the nonprofit realm uh, from fundraising associations and, and others. So uh, look for your niche in that. Again, if you go to the website to nonprofit.courses, I have a, a list of professional associations in nonprofits, like three or 400 of them. Uh, grab that list and um, find something that fits for you. And then volunteering, that's uh, really uh, important, but your best way to connect is to talk to people who have also made the transition. There are a lot of nonprofit job boards. I have a list um, I'll, uh, at the end of this uh, and check out the professional associations. So there are ad boards that uh, are really important to catch up to for nonprofits uh, that you can find. Um, and then now this is something that folks don't really consider. There are support businesses that work with nonprofits. Recognition systems are huge. Some of you might know Karen Singer has a great business here in town uh, where she does uh, ceramic uh, uh, tiling recognition systems, but there are a lot of other companies that do that kind of work. Um, computer support and databases, human resources, website uh, development. I know somebody's on the call today for that. Uh, accounting. And so if you go to professional association websites like um, uh, the Association of Fundraising Professionals and look up what they might call them partners or sponsors, right? And these are the companies that work, uh, that are the ones who serve the nonprofit community. Look there for jobs, uh, especially that, that makes a really good transition point from the business world into the nonprofit world. And of course, create a support network, right? Because your path isn't ending when you get the job. You want to keep up with whatever is going on so that people will uh, be there for you and help you uh, get into that job much more uh, easily, uh, especially if you're coming from outside the sector. They can support you, be there to answer questions. So keep up that network. Don't just cast it off like a lot of folks do when they're done. Oh, I've done a job. I don't need to talk to these people. I'm busy. No, you've got to keep on talking to folks. Use LinkedIn that way for sure. Now, did I do it, right? You know, did I bring some reality? I really wanted to. I didn't want to make this, you know, a, oh, nonprofits are a great place to work. You're going to have some tough time getting into nonprofits. You can make the transition, but it won't be easy. It's really, you know, a lot of just basic you know, blocking and tackling kind of stuff, right? Like getting out and networking with people and educating yourself about where you want to go, developing a kind of a profile of your ideal job in the nonprofit sector. So that's what I have for you. Um, I have a, a list of references here, which I am happy to uh, provide. Um, uh, I'll, uh, let's see, I see 
Oh, interesting. I see a little bit of a typo in one of the URLs. I don't think I did that. Uh, but um, uh, like I said, happy to uh, provide this to you. Uh, just pop me a note or um, we can have it uh, on the, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, uh, you know, just give it out to anybody who's on the call.